And it's a great pleasure to welcome Peter Sands, Executive Director of the Global Fund to Fight HIV and AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria. The fund is the world's largest public-private partnership to set up finance programs to treat and prevent these three diseases and strengthen national health systems, raising and investing almost $4 billion annually. Mr. Sands, it's good to have you with us here on Face to Face. It's great to be here. Infectious diseases constitute a major public health problem worldwide. The economic impact of these diseases is immense, causing significant losses both directly in the developing world and less directly in the developed world. But their impact is not just on economies, it's on whole societies and political systems. Tell us more. Well, you're absolutely right. The analyses that have been done on the economic impact of the three diseases come up with staggeringly large figures. So, for example, WHO has estimated that the benefit of ending malaria as an epidemic by 2030 would be $4 trillion for the global economy. And that's just malaria. But somehow numbers that large is sort of hard to grapple with. And I think it's um, almost easier to think in terms of the impact at the level of a local community or a village. And um, I've been to villages where the burden of malaria is very high. And what happens there is kids are only episodically going to school because they're falling ill with malaria, having to spend some time off. That means their parents aren't able to work in the fields or in trading um, and because and they're looking after sick children. And then you go to another village which has been lifted from the burden of malaria and the dynamic of children going to school, parents able to work, the whole, in a sense, vibe of the community is different. Um, so. The, the, as you say, there is a profound economic impact, but also an um, even more fundamental um, impact on the dynamics of the community as a whole. So it, w it would be logical to focus on prevention? We have to step up our game on prevention, but we also have to treat those who are infected. And indeed, with infectious diseases, treating those who are infected is part of prevention, because if you treat people, they can't infect um, uh, other people. So sometimes there's a bit of a false dichotomy between prevention versus treatment. Actually, we, we have to do both if we want to beat the epidemics. There's been progress made in the fight against HIV and AIDS since the outbreak of the crisis. The Global Fund has been partnering with governments, with civil society, with the private sector to prevent mother-to-child transmission and allow those with HIV to access treatment, ultimately saving tens of millions of lives. Uh, tell us about some of the programs specifically targeting women and girls. Well, first of all, you're absolutely right. There has been enormous progress. When you think back to where we were when the Global Fund was created in 2002, frankly, we had an exploding disaster happening with very high rates of new infections and people dying in their millions. The Global Fund and other partners such as PEPFAR, the governments, work together and have arrested the epidemic. And actually, death rates from HIV are now half what they were at their peak. But still too many people are getting infected with HIV and still too many people are dying. Um, so we have a significant task still on our hands to end the epidemic. And a critical part of that task is actually reducing infection rates among adolescent girls and young women, particularly in southern and eastern Africa. Adolescent girls and young women are disproportionately likely to be infected. In some parts, in some countries, they are up to five times as likely to be infected as adolescent boys of the same age. Uh, why are infection rates still high among young African women in particular? The root cause is actually a set of deep gender 
structural inequalities. So gender-based violence, uh, child marriage, educational disadvantage, economic disempowerment. And actually to tackle the issue of high rates of infection among adolescent girls and young women in these parts of Africa, one has to go beyond the purely biomedical, absolutely the biomedical aspects, sex, access to sexual and reproductive health services are an important part of the answer, but one also has to deal with the broader structural issues. So we're investing in programs that help adolescent girls and, um, stay in school, and that includes um, around um, interventions around menstruation, enabling them to stay in school during menstrual periods. Um, it includes programs around helping um, young girl, girls who get pregnant to continue their education. And it includes bursaries, actually enabling them economically to stay um, in, in school. So education is a big part of it also addressing um, the causes and the dynamics of gender-based violence. And that means also working with um, young men um, as well. So there, there aren't simple answers um, to these um, issues, but they are all about addressing the, the underlying structural determinants of what ultimately ends up with too high rates of HIV infection. It is crucial to bring men on board. Um, Adolescent girls are the face of the HIV and AIDS campaign. How successful has it been? The infection rates among adolescent girls and young women have actually fallen by about 20% in the 13 countries that are most, um, most affected. But that's not enough, um, particularly if we put it in the context of a demographic bulge, which is seeing significant rise in the number of adolescents, both male and female, in those countries. We have to drive down those rates far faster. Um, and actually, we are targeting a nearly 60% reduction in infection rates by 2022. Achievable, you think? It's a stretch. We're gonna have to spend, we're gonna have to invest more money. We're gonna have to get even more effective in our partnerships. Um, we're also gonna have to get really good at listening to the voices of the girls and young women themselves. One of the things we have done is we've funded um, literally hundreds of, of organizations of adolescent girls and young women to enable them to have input and influence in the design and shaping of the programs that are designed um, to help them. Um, and I think that is a, a critical ingredient to the success of what we're trying to do. What is the fund doing to mobilize additional financial resources to address the specific needs of adolescent girls and young women in Africa? Well, the starting point is the mobilization of our core funding. And we are in our replenishment process at the moment. Uh, we have a replenishment conference that will um, be about the funding for the next three years of our program. Uh, that takes place um, in October in Lyon and will be hosted by President Macron. Um, and we are targeting raising at least $14 billion um, to fund the next three years. Um, but also we are working with a range of partners specifically on um, the funding of interventions around adolescent girls and young women. So we have a, um, a, a program called HER, um, HIV Epidemic Response, which is basically a platform for engaging the private sector in funding programs. Um, and so we have um, Durex through Product Red um, is working with us on adolescent girls and young women. Um, likewise, um, Unilever, Standard Bank of South Africa. So we have a number of um, private sector partners who are working specifically on these issues. Uh, you believe in pluralism and diversity of the global health community. Uh, is the fund eyeing new business partners? Uh, any criteria for future potential partners? Well, absolutely, we see scope to draw in um, uh, other partners. And it's not just about drawing in partners for money. It's also drawing in partners for the capabilities they can bring, whether it's uh, capabilities in uh, data analytics or supply chain 
or the fact that they have a voice and a reach and they can um, uh, communicate with um, uh, certain groups of the population. Um, now, of course, we have to be uh, selective about um, our partners. We want partners that share values. We want partners that don't have conflicts of interest. And we have a kind of formal process um, mm -hmm. that, that we go through um, to ensure that we have the right kind of uh, partners. Would you say there is enough commitment at the global level to end the HIV AIDS epidemic uh, and other communicable diseases? Because that particular SDG target is of course very closely tied to other target goals, including poverty, prosperity, gender equality. Th there is a very specific target within SDG 3 around ending the epidemics of HIV, TB and malaria. And as you say, Doing that is not just an achievement around those diseases, but it actually frees up enormous amounts of capacity in health systems, takes a burden off communities. The blunt answer to your question is no. At the moment, we are not on track to achieving that, achieving that goal. To end the epidemics, we have to step up the fight. Stepping up the fight includes raising at least $14 billion dollars um, for the Global Fund's replenishment, but it also includes governments stepping up in the affected countries the amount of domestic resources they are committing to the fight. And it's not just about money. We need more innovation. We need the collaboration between partners to be more effective. And we need a constant focus on really rigorously executing and using data to target our interventions, scale up what works, stop what doesn't, and make sure we're really efficient in our use of resources. And political will. Political will. Well, ultimately, political leadership is the most powerful thing here because building health systems and tackling the issues of health that affect the poorest or the marginalized is a political Thing. It involves redistribution of resources and it involves courage in addressing the barriers to health that many marginalized key populations um, face. If we don't have that political leadership, there's a limit to what the technocrats like me can do. Um, if we do have that political leadership, enormous progress can be made. Looking ahead, what are the priorities for the Global Fund? And uh, yes, what, what are your priorities in the long term and short term? Well, the long term priority, frankly, is to do ourselves out of a job. Um, if we can achieve the objective of ending the epidemics of AIDS, TB and malaria, then I think we would wildly celebrate and say, job done, no more need for the Global Fund. Um, to get there, it's a somewhat different challenge on the three diseases. Um, on HIV, um, it's fundamentally about addressing the issues around adolescent girls and young women and cutting the infection rates effect, um, dramatically, and also um, ensuring that key populations, so sex workers, men who have sex with men, people who inject drugs, transgender, prisoners, migrants, who face barriers to access to services where we're seeing concentrated epidemics, that we break down those barriers and ensure they get prevention services, treatment services. If we achieve those two things, we will make a lot of progress on HIV. On TB, the there are two challenges. Fundamentally, there's drug-sensitive TB, where the TB responds to conventional antibiotics. The big challenge there is, frankly, finding the people with the cases. We have millions of people who are becoming ill with TB who are neither diagnosed nor treated. And then you've got the nastier form of TB, which is called drug-resistant TB, where we really need to step up the fight in terms of identifying and treating these people with what is a very nasty disease and, frankly, a significant threat to health security. On malaria, we seem to have two challenges with each of these things. But anyway, yes. on, on malaria, there are basically two stories. On malaria, there are a bunch of countries which are making very good progress towards eliminating malaria. The challenge there is just to make sure they don't lose focus, because it's very tempting when the number of cases falls to a very low level to sort of stop doing things. We want malaria 
eradicated in the way that Argentina and Algeria have just been certified as malaria-free. But perhaps the biggest challenge with malaria is in the highest burden countries, where at the moment we're doing enough to save lives every year, more lives every year, but we're not doing enough to break the transmission dynamics. And we've got to get over the hump in terms of breaking the cycle between mosquito and human to ensure that we get them onto a track towards eventual elimination. So somewhat different challenges across all three diseases, but all with the same goal in mind of saying, how do we get to ending the epidemics by 2030? Your specific message here at Women Deliver 2019, what are you telling them? The critical thing is that gender inequalities are a significant driver of the dynamics of the three big infectious diseases affecting humanity. If we do not deal with, if we do not face up to this and tackle those gender inequalities, we will not beat the diseases. And it's probably most acute with HIV AIDS, but it's true of the other two diseases as well. Peter Sands, uh, Executive Director of the Global Fund for Fighting HIV, uh, Tuberculosis and Malaria. We thank you for joining us on Face to Face here. Thank you very much. Thank you.